We work. We save. We invest. With most investments, there is a risk of losing some hard-earned cash. But with sound advice and a little luck, we can make money. Unless someone has stacked the deck against us. I hope my dad's not rolling over in his grave right now, knowing that uh, I took his hard-earned money and invested it in a scheme that lost it. Most investment professionals look out for the best interests of their clients, but some lie, cheat, or steal for their own gain. You don't have to live in New York to run into the likes of Bernie Madoff, who ran the largest financial fraud operation in U.S. history. Millions of dollars are also lost to scams in the heartland. Our office has received about 200 calls a year from victims, uh, and we will have at any one time about 60 active investigations going on. It's a Wolf of Wall Street sort of thing. We're robbing Peter and paying Paul. They were living large. Through pyramid schemes and real estate scams, investors are built by people they thought they could trust. Many victims are left emotionally scarred and financially distraught. Well, with the physical crime, you can typically recover from that. With a financial crime, a lot of times, particularly if you're senior, it's just not time to recover your losses. But we can protect ourselves from financial fraud, learn from victims, recognize the warning signs, and work with those responsible for going after the scammers. It's your money. You know, do your homework. Scammed, Investment Fraud Revealed is funded by a grant from the Investor Protection Trust, IPT. The IPT is a nonprofit organization devoted to investor education. Since 1993, the IPT has worked with the states to provide the independent objective investor education needed by all Americans to make informed investment decisions. Details at InvestorProtection.org. This is what gives pastors bad names, is people like Von Rees. He was no more a church pastor than I could fly out this window. Von Reeves formally preached at the West Side Church of Christ in Sullivan, Indiana, southeast of Terre Haute. But he left the pulpit for a new calling. Reeves, with the help of his three sons, opened Alinar, which was in the business of selling church bonds. From the town square, he later guided his flock to financial ruin. What was really terrible and alarming about Vaughn Reeves and what his sons were doing uh, was the fact that these were pitched uh, to Christians. Believers like Jeannie Bowers believed they were helping fellow Christians by buying bonds that were to finance church construction or expansion. As Christians, you're taught to reach out, and if there's something you can do to help a fellow Christian, you certainly must do it. I mean, it's just part of your DNA. In reality, Reeves was preying on those who pray by operating a Ponzi scheme where there are never any actual profits. Someone will say they're investing your money and you're expecting return on your investment, but the only money that you will ever receive is money that may come in from a later investor that is also a victim. Bauer's husband, Ron, invested nearly half of his retirement money with Alinar. In the beginning, the couple received a few small checks. Pretty soon, you know, there's not enough money to pay all the investors, and so the scheme will crumble. And so that's the Ponzi scheme. The Bowers lost nearly all of their $160,000 investment. A similar situation happened to their longtime friends, Jack and Nancy Beverstock, who invested around $50,000 in the church bonds. We thought we had done all the research and made sure it was secure and we just thought we'd done the right thing. It gave us a good feeling. Reeves okay. relied on affinity to perpetrate his Ponzi scheme. Affinity is where uh, someone belongs to a group or a church or a club and just because someone else is a member in that group or church or club, they believe that they can be trusted. Many times that trust is not warranted. Reeves' Ponzi scheme spread across Indiana and became the largest investment fraud case in state history. Simultaneously, it moved throughout the country. At its peak, the scam had lured nearly 10,000 investors who bought $120 million in bonds. The way that 
Reeves was initially, I guess, caught were several complaints were made to the uh, United States uh, Securities Exchange Commission. The FBI spent lots of time in Sullivan looking through evidence, but with the enormity of the case, they chose not to pursue criminal prosecution. That's when Indiana's Secretary of State's office took control. Our team, rather than look at the entire universe and the, and the entire scope of this you know, massive fraud, zero in on about five or six of these uh, church bonds that were issued. That way they could more easily expose the fraud and explain it to jurors. You could show the fraud and you could show Vaughn Reeves and his sons profiting personally from some of these church bonds, committing fraud uh, on a number of felonies. Criminal investigator Charlie Williams with the Secretary of State Securities Division looked for clues in the financials of roughly 30 companies through which Alinar sold church bonds. And I'm looking for a company that's not selling bonds, a company that, that shouldn't be there, doesn't make sense. Investigators figured out how the funds were set up and then followed the money trail. It led to an alarming discovery. Only part of the money from the bond sales was going into the fund to pay back investors. The remainder was siphoned off and diverted into a company called Churchman's Capital, essentially going into Reeves's pocket. So now the big thing you've got, you've got hundreds of people spread through about 30 companies. And all of them are being ripped off. Nearly $6 million from investors was either hidden in that company or used to pay expenses. Investigators continued along the paper trail. At the end of Churchman's Capital, you found Churchman's mortgage. So we started taking a look at why would you have a mortgage company when you're selling church bonds? The mortgage company, run by one of Reeves's sons, revealed the secret. Well, that's got his airplanes in it. It's got all their homes in it. It's got their Porsches. It's got vehicles that he's bought for uh, people that work for the company. And it's all their salaries. Bang, that, that was our thing. In 2010, a jury found Reeves guilty on nine felony counts. He was sentenced to 54 years in prison and ordered to pay restitution. Investors like the Bowers received only pennies on the dollar for their losses. To make ends meet, they've added beef cattle to their farm and sold some land. Well, you beef cows, you don't need a whole lot of care until you get calves on. The Bowers say they no longer have the physical energy for farm work. After retiring from their full-time jobs in the city, they had hoped to travel the country in their RV. But that dream was plowed under. The freedom, yeah. freedom to, to do, to do, to do what, what we worked yeah. all these years for yeah. was taken away with this Eleanor. As for Reeves' sons, two received jail time and a third was not charged. Meantime, Reeves continues to pay for his transgressions at the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City. He won't have freedom from behind bars until his scheduled release in 2035, when he's 91 years old. You may remember money manager Marcus Schranker, who made national headlines by jumping out of a plane and faking his death to avoid years of legal and financial problems. That was probably the most narcissistic individual that I've dealt with, just by virtue of his business being called Icon. You know, it was like he was laughing at people that he was taking money from. From his former office near Geist Reservoir in Indianapolis, Schranker often sought clients who shared his passion of flying. In 1992, he made a cold call to Delta airline pilot Ron Johnson. When he first called me, he was also an aviator, and of course that immediately established a common bond. Schranker drove more than an hour to Johnson's house in Batesville to see what money he had to invest for a retirement plan. After that, they kept in contact with phone calls and emails and continued to meet once a year. Johnson thought he was building trust and forming a friendship. Like many fraudsters, uh, Marcus Schrenker was a skilled liar and uh, he was a very good salesman. Fraudsters build trust through a variety of ways. One time, Schrenker even flew his stunt plane over to give the fellow pilot the ride of his life. I went flying with him and we do aerobatic stunts and 
as aviators, you know, that was definitely uh, something that, that we both enjoyed doing. They helped cement that, that friendship. They conducted business together for a decade. Then one day, Schrenker urged Johnson to move a large sum of money he received from a settlement between Delta and its pilots to a different account. Johnson trusted his advice. I don't ask you to tell me how to fly an airplane. I'm not going to tell you how to you know, invest you know, on my behalf. Schrenker prompted Johnson to take some of his Fidelity investments and move them into what he called a Euro fund. He urged other investors, like Mike Elma, to do the same. The money that we gave him for the currency fund that he allegedly was investing in never showed up anywhere. So I questioned it constantly for two or three months. Marcus could go in and manipulate the data from Fidelity so that it looked like they were always earning a return on their money. And as long as people are earning money, they'll not question the legitimacy of it when in reality they had been losing this money. The Elmas called it quits after they grew weary of Schrenker's evasiveness and lost confidence yeah, in his so-called Euro fund. Number one, you can't do that. That's illegal. You can't use cash to buy more cash. And number two, why would you take a high dollar and buy a low dollar? So right away, we figured that's where the scam was. A former employee tipped off investigators who quickly obtained warrants to search Schrenker's office and home for evidence of financial wrongdoing. We found the investor files, but uh, most of them, anything that had to do with the euros had been pulled out. But he had a large uh, file server. Uh, it was big enough that it could easily run the Secretary of State's office without a problem. Now, my next thought was, well, why would a small investor need that large a server unless you're doing something in it? Forensic accountants drained the computer system to look for clues of wrongdoing. It showed Schrenker was using his client's money to pay for his lavish lifestyle instead of investing on their behalf. Investigator Haskett searched the home. He had five Lexuses lined up in the garage. You had the swimming pool, the movie theater, the toys of someone who enjoys playing in the adult world. We found a girlfriend. We found a condo that the girlfriend's in, which was not very far from his house. We found that a lot of money had been spent on both women, rehabbing or whatever you want to call, fixing them up uh, the way he wanted them. Authorities confiscated assets like a baby grand piano, jewelry, guns, and a boat to sell at auction to help pay back investors. I have sold the motorcycle for $9,000. There was, I think, some evidence, uh, some concerns about uh, flight, both literally and figuratively, by Marcus Shrinker, uh, fleeing the state, absconding with the money, trying to disappear. Concerns were warranted. On January 11, 2009, Schrenker took off in his plane and was scheduled to fly to Destin, Florida. But near Birmingham, Alabama, he made a distress call. He told air traffic controllers his windshield imploded and he was bleeding profusely. So right now what we believe is after he made this fraudulent emergency call, he set the plane into an autopilot mode and parachuted out of the plane. Schrenker jumped out in Alabama, where he had previously stashed a getaway motorcycle. The plane continued to travel 200 miles before it crashed in the woods near a residential area in Milton, Florida. Yes, it is very frightening, and to know that it was deliberate is rather infuriating. When we got to the crash site, there was no one present in the plane. We did not find any blood in the plane, and the door was open. After a three-day manhunt, authorities captured Schrenker in a campground in Florida. Johnson was shocked to hear about the events on the news. Felt very betrayed by him uh, having done that to us. So, especially considering that he, you know, I treated him like a very close friend, you know, having him to the house and, you know, I met his children and, and I got to know him quite well and, and to think that he was, you know, doing this behind their back, it was, it was very hurtful. Uh, it, it definitely uh, was, was a bitter pill to swallow. Most of those victims were shocked. That money's not there and it's not real. And you have lost whatever the difference is between uh, what you originally invested and what you have now. 
Schranker scammed the Johnsons out of several hundred thousand dollars. The Almas lost 50,000. They were among 76 investment clients in 10 states and overseas who lost a total of $4 million. Schranker was released from a Florida prison in September 2015 after serving time for securities fraud and crashing his plane. Johnson, who delayed retirement due to the scam, has a lingering question for Schranker. Why would you do such a thing? You know, you had, you had everything going for you, and, and, and there surely had been other ways to uh, uh, get yourself out of the hole you were digging than, than trying to do what you did. He knew at the point in 2010 when we made our investment that he was going under. And he took that $300,000 anyway. And he used it to probably pay rents that he wasn't able to cover. So he's a criminal. Authorities arrested Indianapolis lawyer Charles Blackwelder in 2014 for running a real estate Ponzi scheme aimed at Indiana seniors. The investment opportunity was a real estate program. And in fact, it had very legitimate qualities to it, which with some of the best frauds, uh, there is a, a grain of truth or an air of, of legitimacy to the fraud, which can help make them successful. Through his company, CFS and Carmel, Blackwelder sold investment opportunities to seniors to legally shield their assets from Medicaid spend down requirements before entering nursing facilities. Basically, he and his daughter, Kara Grummy, peddled fractional shares of residential and commercial rental properties and promised a proportional return of the rent to the initial investor. They also led family members to believe they would inherit the investment upon the death of their loved ones. So the investors had this uh, steady stream of income, which they could maintain Medicaid eligibility with none of the hassle that usually comes with ownership of rental property. The program worked as intended for a number of years, but at some point, Blackwelder faced personal financial problems and started swindling seniors. It was at that time when he starts taking steps uh, that are not good for investors. While their names should have been placed on the deeds, the properties were oversold and over mortgaged. Then on some of these rental properties, there may have been three or four owners, and the investors didn't know that another investor allegedly owned the same property. Of the 40 properties in Carmel, Fishers, and Indianapolis, 35 were oversold. Money problems multiplied. The math didn't add up, and the properties were not worth their initial cost. Some of the properties didn't sell for what the people had purchased them for, so they lost money. Renters weren't placed into the residential properties. Commercial properties had been bought that the individuals had no title to at all. By the time the scam unraveled, Blackwelder had bilked more than 300 Hoosier families out of more than $19 million. We lost our entire property that had been in our family for three generations. Roy Harbert, trustee of his mother's estate, was among those who faced Blackwelder at the sentencing in the Hamilton Superior Court. He says the financial theft caused more devastation than a home invasion depicted in films. Armed criminals wearing ski masks like in the Dirty Harry movies and, and holding a gun in your face with a flashlight, empty your home of its possessions. That's horrible. That's traumatic. I mean, that is, that is truly a violation. I mean, there's no other word for it. But what they did was worse. They didn't steal the contents of our homes. They stole our home. They stole our home. The Secretary of State's office started getting phone calls questioning the investments, which prompted the criminal investigation. At the same time, the Securities Division met with state Medicaid authorities to ensure seniors continued to receive long-term care. We wanted to give them a heads up to know, hey, listen, there's going to be a problem in Hamilton County within this particular area. We don't want people to lose eligibility or to suffer uh, further. Months after the sentencing, Muncie resident Tanya Reed still reels from the pain Blackwelder caused her father-in-law. Ralph Reed died at age 95, shortly after learning he lost most of his life savings that he invested with CFS. Did Mr. Blackwelder cause that death? No, age caused that death. Did he hasten it? Yes, he did. 
because after Pop found out that his money was gone and everything that he intended for it to be wasn't going to happen, it took a toll on him, you know, as far as his will to, to even try to, to live longer. Building a home and a nest egg took decades of hard work for Reed. He grew up poor and often collected coal that fell off trains to help heat his family's home. After a stint in the Navy, he ran a furniture store and later became an auctioneer. He had a hard life and he did not want that for his kids. You know, he wanted to leave them something that was so important to him. Reed invested $206,000 with Black Welder. He received a couple of small payments before the House of Cards fell. It certainly took a toll on him, and it, it took a toll on his children. It took a toll on me because we had to deal with him every day. We had to see the disappointment, and that was hard to take. They devastate lives. They do. They, call, they cause victims to commit suicide. They cause families to crumble. Meanwhile, through a plea agreement, Cara Grummy avoided prison time, but served probation. Charles Blackwelder received a 15-year sentence, including four years behind bars at the Newcastle Correctional Facility, with the remainder in work release and home detention. The father and daughter are ordered to pay more than $19 million in restitution through a court-appointed receiver. No, means you're not sorry. You're not sorry, you're sorry you got caught. You're sorry somebody turned you in. In most cases, investors recoup only a small amount of money stolen from them by financial perpetrators. Generally, fraudsters have already spent it on things you can't get back. Some have gone on trips or to sporting events, held lavish parties, and sent their kids to college. I guess I'd, I'd had kind of come to terms with the realization that we'd probably be lucky to get a dime back on the dollar, if that. Prevention becomes the best weapon in the fight against financial fraud. It starts with learning to identify the warning signs. The red flags include unsolicited calls, emails, or social media. If you get them, don't respond. There are no investments without risk, so if someone says there is absolutely no risk, then that's a red flag. Check with the Secretary of State's office to see if a product is registered and the person doing business is legitimate before making an investment. We can tell them whether the individual is registered, whether the item is registered, and whether we have any activity on that person. Avoid people who explain complex strategies and urge you to make quick decisions. Steer clear if they're missing documentation or refuse to explain a product to your accountant or attorney. Also, beware of overly consistent returns. Banks and investment firms would offer them if they were plausible. It's a guy on the corner that's promising 12% returns and double digit returns. It's not possible in today's market to do that. With any investment comes a risk of losing money. But those who had their nest eggs stolen by fraudsters in what they thought were legitimate financial deals share their frustrations and advice so others don't make the same mistakes. I'm angry that we were so gullible. I had done mortgages when I was with the credit union. I should have known when they said real estate, we didn't have a closing, you know? We didn't have a recorded mortgage. The thing I guess that I feel right now, I trusted my lawyer and he trusted this investment and we did it based on all that and I didn't do any background. I, tr I, you know, I, I considered it a, a trusting thing and the risk to be minimal and here we are today. It's your money, you know, do your homework, uh, get it into a system uh, a brokerage account or some system to where you can cross-check what's going on, monitor every transaction. The earlier people learn to prevent investment fraud, the better. That's why the Secretary of State's office takes its education message to children. Here at Junior Achievement's Biz Camp, Matt Kestian, who's actually an attorney with the Prosecution Assistance Unit, poses as a businessman selling an item for a gaming system. You got iron swords, they wear out, things like that, but this emerald sword, indestructible, would last forever. 
He offers the kids a chance to invest $2.99 for the sword, and he also gives them an opportunity to buy stock in the company. But he insists they must act quickly before he leaves. I see some of you seem pretty excited about this idea. Do you think any of your friends that aren't here or aren't in this camp might also be interested? Yeah, yeah. OK. The kids eagerly sign up, not realizing they're being taken for a ride as part of the educational exercise. And the reason they do the scam is to let kids know that you know sometimes there may be deals out there that, that aren't, aren't what they think. The scam is revealed the next day so that the kids can learn from the activity. I would like to speak with you today about some red flags that you may have seen with AJ to prevent this type of scheme from happening to you again. Early on, if they start learning the lessons that you need to be skeptical. If, if something sounds too good to be true, maybe it is. Doesn't mean you know, it's not real, but you at least need to be skeptical and look into it. In addition to programs like this and others designed for adults, the Secretary of State's office also works with police to combat fraud statewide. Here at the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy in Plainfield, criminal investigators can take courses on how to handle firearms and defend themselves against attacks they may encounter with financial perpetrators. They train us and we train them as well. And, you know, it's a great partnership. On the flip side, local and state law enforcement officials gain an understanding of investment fraud and how to investigate such cases. The partnership provides additional tools in the fight against financial crime that helps protect your pocket. Perpetrators of financial crime seem to share common threads, greed, and putting their own financial needs ahead of others. When these defendants come to court at the end of a case, they show very little remorse, and it's very troubling that they have committed these frauds done this damage to investors. Such criminals often turn financial dreams into nightmares for their victims. That's why investors will want to diligently research reputable business people and products, as well as contact the Secretary of State's office. The important thing for people to remember is they should never feel embarrassed or ashamed if they think they've been a victim, because these scammers ha work at it every day, at every angle, and they're professionals at scamming people. The sooner investment fraud is reported, the sooner authorities can work with law enforcement to freeze assets and hopefully get money back for victims. If we work together with these other agencies, combined forces will win out. Scammed, Investment Fraud Revealed is funded by a grant from the Investor Protection Trust, IPT. The IPT is a nonprofit organization devoted to investor education. Since 1993, the IPT has worked with the states to provide the independent objective investor education needed by all Americans to make informed investment decisions. Details at investorprotection.org.